I think people need now more than ever to study and learn from history so that history does not repeat. And I know that's something that we've said on this channel many times, but I feel like I've never meant it more, perhaps, than I mean it now. It's taken on a whole new dimension. I've spent a large portion of my adulthood doing my own research and attempting to come to my own conclusions about, I guess, basically everything. Everything that I've been taught and told in my lifetime. And this year, more than ever, I've been backtracking, retracing my steps. It's that whole saying about when you come to a seemingly insurmountable problem and it doesn't appear there's a way forward, sometimes the way forward is the way back. Sometimes you just have to go backwards and put things into perspective and learn the real lessons that are waiting in history about certain things. Today, we're not going to go all that far back. Today, I just want to talk to you guys for a little bit about the American Revolution. I found some old VHS video on YouTube put out by the Herbert Hoover Library in 2002. The guy describes the American Revolution as the most successful revolution in modern world history. Thirteen distinct colonies grew and prospered, sharing only boundaries and loyalty to the British crown. But starting in 1763, common worries over colonial rights escalated into a united protest against the British King and Parliament. Over the next 25 years, Americans became the most successful revolutionaries in world history. I'm not saying that statement is true just because he said it. I just know I heard him say it. And I started to think about why someone would make that claim based on what is known and recorded officially recognized history. I've come to the conclusion that one of the most overlooked things about the American Revolution is the shift in how people viewed themselves in relation to the world around them that took place in the people who rose up to change it at that time. But that's not how it's ever really portrayed, is it? I mean, not really. Back when I was in school, it was just taught these poor, poor victims of the kings who just wanted religious freedom were just being starved out of house and home with horrible, unfair taxes and acts. And then they throw a few out there, like the Stamp Act or the Tea Act or something. But I, I'm, I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about the Sugar Act, which was the American Revenue Act as part of the Grenville Acts, the Stamp Act, which basically put a tax on daily living through taxing seemingly countless forms of entertainment and legal documents, you had the Quartering Act, the Declaratory Act, the Townshend duties, the enforcement of the Robin Hood-esque surveyors of the King's Woods, which they brought back, which resulted in the Pine Tree Riot in New Hampshire. You had the seizing of ships to enforce customs, the impressing of men into the British Navy, the attempt to ship certain colonists accused of crimes back to England for what would certainly not be a fair trial by a jury of their peers, thus violating their right to self-rule, the Boston Massacre, the Tea Act, the Coercive and Quebec Acts, which were also known as the Intolerable Acts, part of which included the shutting down by military force of Boston Port, to any outside traffic that wasn't approved by Britain prior to the stationing of at least four regiments of British troops there to be followed by the passage of an even worse updated version of the Quartering Act. You also had the New England Restraining Act, they actually called it that, which not only forbid the colonies from conducting trade with any other country that was in England, but also banned the colonies from fishing in the North Atlantic. You had General Gage seizing the Massachusetts colony's Charleston arsenal, thereby taking away their right to defend themselves. Oh, and ordering the then newly appointed Massachusetts Governor General Gage to use any force necessary to enforce all the British acts and to stop the buildup of colonial militias, which again is not allowing them to protect themselves. And I almost forgot, this all officially got kicked off after the Seven Years' War ended and the Proclamation of 1763 was signed, which forbid the colonists who just fought in the Seven Years' War for Britain from settling west of the Appalachians in the new land Britain supposedly won from the French in that war that the colonists helped fight, including veteran colonists who were granted land deeds 
in exchange for their military service in that war, only to then be told once it was won that they weren't allowed to go there. And they restricted trade with the Native Americans only to those individuals who the British Parliament granted a license to, all seemingly in an effort to keep the colonists confined strictly within the eastern seaboard. Then they sent in 10,000 British soldiers to try and force American settlers who were out in that area back to the eastern seaboard and to stop new settlers from crossing the Appalachian border. So they constructed military forts along that border to contain the colonists within the colonies. The costs of the forts would then be recouped by all the taxes they were trying to force the colonists to pay in the 12 years leading up to the revolution. And while some may have described King George at that point as a divine monster seated up on high, drunk and mad with power, lauding his ability to pass whatever act he so desired against the colonists from his oh-so-lofty position on the throne there, he probably couldn't even imagine that anyone would have dared defy him, let alone repeatedly defy him, because what we may consider blatantly obvious tyrannies today weren't really looked at that way by the king at the time because he was the king, right? There's a movie out, I don't know if many people watched it, but it's called The Madness of King George because he had a period of mental illness. And even at the point covered in the film, which is after the American Revolution, the amount of kowtowing by the people to this king simply because he was king is to my American mind anathema. It's really kind of sickening to watch. I mean, I get it. It's a movie, uh, of course, but I also have to keep in mind that that's a movie that had they had the technology to make that movie back then, uh, heads would have likely rolled out of the Tower of London over it because despite being the king somehow, many kings and queens throughout history have not been able to handle any criticism whatsoever without torturing, maiming, or executing someone over it. So, but you know, one thing history has shown us pretty clearly is that kings pretty much did whatever they wanted to whenever they wanted to. That was referred to as the king's prerogative. Even once parliament was created in England, many kings still saw themselves as God's chosen divine representative on earth, seated high up on a throne quite above everyone else. And, and the people, especially the people in parliament, uh, would not even dare directly criticize the king, no matter what his actions were. If the king was ever perceived as doing anything wrong, it certainly must be because his evil advisors had somehow been able, through their sheer wickedness, to steer the divine king in the wrong direction. Because in those times, quite simply, it was not physically possible for the king to be wrong. He could not be personally questioned, and he certainly could not be held personally accountable for anything that he did. I mean, this was not about democracy. There was no such thing as an officially respected consent of the governed before that time. These people were subjects. The king knew best, right? He knew what the people's rightful place was, and that was as faithful subjects under his rule. There is nothing in the constitution of this land that entitles us to bring a king to trial. This type of situation has continued to persist for centuries, despite the fact that the king lived his entire life in a world where, just by virtue of the fact that he was king, and had been in many cases groomed to be so from his elite upbringing and childhood, there's no way that he could possibly understand the perspective of the common person that he ruled over. It was just not even possible. Kings and queens spent their entire lives in an elevated position, always looking down, right? Just surrounded on all sides by sycophantic yes-men groveling at their royal footstool. So whatever they decided to spend money on, the people were taxed to pay for it. And that included the lavish lifestyle up to the war, whatever it is. But in, in return for taxing the people for whatever the king deemed necessary, the parliament would get concessions from the king. Much has been said in this house about the so-called iniquity of certain members being financially involved in national projects. I say if we in parliament cannot gain from ruling the country, there's really very little 
So it's this very cushy arrangement of back padding, which many corrupt members of parliament uh, at that time, some of whom bribed their way to get in there in the first place, were totally happy to and definitely continue that completely corrupt system. Go up from the beginning, a provisional government not truly representative of the people, but have the people elected you. Has this house gone once to the people that come forth to represent? No, it has not. So by the time the American Revolution went down, King George III and his ministry didn't really dream of people simply telling the king no, they weren't going to pay for it because King George III was the king and the people were just lowly commoners subjected to him. But it's not even that he didn't dream of it, he couldn't dream of it. He, it wasn't possible because such a thing just did not exist in his realm of reality. He's the king. So let's skip ahead 244 years from King George III to William Gates III. The last time I bothered to look, it has now been reported that this man has somewhere in the vicinity of $106 billion. We're told he's either the first or second richest man on the planet, and he's tied up there with Jeff Bezos. I mean, they don't ever seem to really add the Rothschilds on this list, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but this is what we're told. In 2015, it was announced that William Gates III was worth more than the GDP of at least 38 countries. And without getting into all the greedy details of the cheap, unethical situation surrounding Gary Kildall and the quick and dirty ripoff of the operating system that Kildall designed, we all know what the prime feature of 2020 has been, and we all know who suddenly became one of the main faces promoting the official response to it. President Trump has made no secret of his desire to see a COVID-19 vaccine soon, ideally before the November election. How worried are you, Bill, that the approval process is being hijacked by politics? Well, that would be a, a tragedy. And any suggestion that, you know, a politician, you know, helped create the vaccine or it's faster because of a politician is a very dangerous thing. Do you still trust the FDA? So it sounds to me like you have, you're harboring perhaps some reservations. What, what about the CDC? One of the big risks in politicization is public confidence. Polls show a third of Americans will refuse to get vaccinated and a majority of Americans believe a vaccine is being rushed. Has the damage already been done? I hope not. Uh... Americans, and for that matter, Bill, citizens of the world have been put in this awkward position where they may find themselves more trusting of what they hear from the private sector, from the companies developing these vaccines, as opposed to what they hear from this government or perhaps other governments. Given the accelerated timeline on which these vaccines are being developed, how confident are you that they'll be not just effective, but safe as well? Well, the... Uh... We've done many videos on this channel about this man, so I won't be rehashing all of that old ground here, but... When he isn't spending a billion dollars to surround the Earth in real-time surveillance satellites or conducting risky multi-million dollar geoengineering experiments to block out the sun or recycling poop into water that he expects other people to drink or paying comic book artists to depict him as a superhero, he's been pouring his access funds into experimental vaccine and birth control technologies up to and including a remote-controlled contraceptive microchip implant. That all sounds crazy, but that's all stuff that's happened. That's not a theory, that's just fact. <laughs> Back in April, President Trump announced he was going to halt funding to the United Nations World Health Organization. Instructing my administration to halt 
funding of the World Health Organization while a review is conducted. Which meant that the WHO's number one funder became Gates. So I'll say that again. Modern humanity as a whole reached a point this year that William Gates III became the number one funder of something called the World Health Organization. And you didn't exactly see the media jumping over themselves to point out the fact that this guy also is the guy who they're running to left and right to promote everywhere they can in the face of this situation. And the media was supposed to be our unofficial fourth branch of government, right? The protection of whose press freedom was spelled out in the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights has been solidly undermined by billionaire-backed philanthropies over the last century. Gates, through his charitable Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has been funding everything from media outlets to journalistic institutes around the globe for years, giving money over time to mainstream names like ABC, NBC, National Public Radio, BBC, The London Guardian, Al Jazeera, Univision, Medium, The Atlantic, The Financial Times, that's just naming a few. Not to mention organizations like the Center for Investigative Reporting or charitable outlets affiliated with major news organizations like BBC Media Action or the New York Times Neediest Cases Fund. The man who once paid to have himself depicted as a comic book superhero has also funded media companies that then went on to create so-called documentaries that depict Gates in a positive light. See how that works? I mean, the full list also includes internet fact-checking associations, which are now determining what is deemed quote-unquote true or fake news, and therefore in some cases what is allowed or not, or what is censored or not, on our major internet platforms, which are now the modern digital public square. To say that all this financial backing isn't shaping the quality and nature of the information that the public ultimately receives, or doesn't receive, as news, is just silly. I mean, it was reported that by June 2020, June of this year, the Gates Foundation had already given away more than $250 million towards journalism to go along with the millions upon millions that he spent on the major science that this society is relying upon. So in short, this isn't just some billionaire happily swimming around in his gold in a vault somewhere like Scrooge McDuck. The things that William Gates III spends his money on end up affecting us all. The majority of the money that made this man so wealthy, he got through his company Microsoft selling his flagship product, Windows. Windows is the operating system that somewhere between 77 and 88% of the world's computer owners use to access their computers and thus the internet. So in other words, he got rich over more than three quarters of the world spending the last three decades paying William Gates III a toll to enter our new digital world through his portal that's actually called Windows. Bill Gates, uh, former CEO of uh, Microsoft Corporation is here. You know Bill is uh, the guy who gets a dollar every time you hear this. And that portal keeps requiring periodic updates, so new tolls. There have been 16 versions of Windows that have been released since the 1980s. And as users of Windows 7 found out last year, your computer will get to a point that you won't be able to run new programs or continue to receive necessary security updates unless you take the upgrade. So there's just not a whole lot of choices out there for this. And the visual symbolism of Windows 10 could not be more clear. When the computer first turns on, you see a black void with a single blue Microsoft window logo glowing in the middle, leaving users waiting to access their computer and the internet through William Gates III's Windows 10 portal, sitting in the darkness of our otherwise half-digital world. One of the intro screens to Windows 10 even uses a visual metaphor that likens its users to sheep. So this man's become one of the main faces of the health crisis of 2020. And he's made all these media rounds. They're promoting him everywhere as our savior and why didn't we listen to him? But it's also become glaringly apparent this year that this man feels he's at a level of authority now where he's telling us all that we're gonna have to be approved after this crisis is over 
to enter businesses again, likely through one of his novel vaccines that he's funding, complete with a digital code to prove we've received it. And which activities like mass gatherings uh, may be in a certain sense more optional. And so until you're widely vaccinated, those may not uh, come back uh, at all. Stating in a March 18 Reddit Ask Me Anything session that quote, eventually we will have some digital certificates to show who has recovered or been tested recently, or when we have a vaccine, who has received it. And he's saying we're going to need authorization through a system, a new system that's going to be put in place. In one appearance, he referred to this as a digital certificate that he says we will be expected to use in the real world. Now, we don't want to have a lot of recovered people. You know, to be clear, we're trying through the shutdown uh, in the United States to not get to 1% of the population infected. I believe we will be able to avoid that uh, with the um, having this economic pain. Eventually, what we'll have to have is certificates of who's a recovered person, who's a vaccinated person. So the large majority of people in this world are going to go from using Windows as a portal to access their computers and the internet to that now evolving into being required to use whatever this new digital certificate will be as a portal to transact business and participate in society in the physical world. So let's think about this. The Stamp Act of 1765 was in many ways provoked as an issue, but this is because it was an excellent showcase for the corrupt principles at hand. Yes, the Stamp Act would have been an economic burden to the colonies, who had already been run ragged by years of war, and which, see if this sounds familiar, saw people living in a time where there was an incredibly massive wealth gap, and people were having a really hard time making ends meet. But simply funding a tax is really not the base issue here. The Stamp Act was important to reject, not just because of the lack of due representation or the colonists having a say over those who would govern them and decide what taxes to levy upon them. This was doubly important to reject because the Stamp Act sought to impose a check and middleman over literally every avenue of colonial life at the time. So many items that people would buy or use for both business and leisure, from household necessities to communication through magazines and newspapers, which are obviously necessary to keep the population informed, to important documents that society required, contracts and mortgages and marriage licenses and things like this. These things would not all just be taxed, but like the name says, they were requiring a stamp to be put on these items. You had to have the stamp for the thing to be official and be used or else you could face a fine. But if you require a stamp, you can also deny a stamp. So these activities were also being regulated in this way because by denying a stamp, you could also deny basic participation in those activities within the society. That's really how far away is that from today's concept of a digital certificate that allows the public access to what are public spaces and people's private businesses within the bounds of our physical world. I mean, this, this is an affront innumerably worse than the Stamp Act. It's multiplied by square root, okay? And as such, it, 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 it must be rejected. People have gotten used to giving away little permissions, ignoring these 8,000 page user agreements, but this isn't just happening on a screen in your office anymore. This is now going to bleed over into the street, into the physical reality. Far too much is being given away here. And I agree that the, the digital age and the internet offer all these conveniences, commerce and entertainment and communication and connectivity. It's clearly become enmeshed within the fabric of our modern world, our modern life. But the reality that these conveniences are being dangled before us at the cost of many of the liberties established and won over the previous centuries is completely unacceptable. Though these devices offer benefit and innovation, they're not necessary. They shouldn't be necessary to our lives. 
which were gotten on long before these things were developed and put in everyone's hand. That these systems and these platforms would act as a check upon access to the many avenues of that pre-existing and necessary portion of life and connection in physical society is disgusting. It should be rejected solidly by the people who need to again become free-thinking enough to recognize what's really at stake here. These things are supposed to be benefiting our lives, right? Not stripping us away to abject submission and digital slavery. And though it seems like people are frivolous about giving away their consent and their sovereignty, we need to recognize again the, the jewel that this really is, the essential kernel to our existence here. All people are and as a right ought to be free and sovereign. And nobody has a right to cut that condition out of your life. As much as we scorn the people who have attempted to do so in previous centuries, we should scorn any attempting of it now. Although it may be without the literal appearance of implements of intimidation and chains, nonetheless revoking the natural state of inherent God-given freedom on the modern half-physical, half-digital frontier is unacceptable. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it, because like so many kings of the past, including King George III, we have William Gates III now assuring us that the economic pain he tells us we all have to endure is necessary. So we're going to take the pain in the economic dimension, huge pain, to get through this crisis, despite the fact that, let's just be honest, this is a person who couldn't possibly understand what economic pain feels like in a personal way on the same level as the rest of humanity who doesn't have $106 billion. Bill, on whether you think we're heading in the right direction, do you feel like our economy is heading in the right place, that humanity is heading in the right place? Are we in a better position now than you thought we were in five years ago? Well, the five years ago, I said that the p pandemic uh, is this unaddressed, very, very scary thing. This person makes more than most bachelor degree holding adults make in the United States in their entire lifetimes in an hour and a half. I actually read somewhere he makes $308 a second which if that's true means if he was walking down the sidewalk and saw $300 lying on the ground, it wouldn't even be worth his time to bend over and pick it up, okay? So from that perspective, his tone deaf statements on the economic pain he went on television to announce to the rest of us commoners that we just have to accept, it is impossible to believe this person could even actually feel empathy about that or even really know what that concept is to be talking about it at all. Certainly more dangerous than flu, not as dangerous as something like Ebola or, or, or SARS, but more dangerous than, than flu by a factor. But, but, but infectious and, and also infectious before symptoms. And you know what? I'll even throw this in there. He's even started wearing purple all the time while he's doing this. Just like the scarlet-clad kings of old. This guy might not be walking around with a crown on his head, but, but I think it's weird that people aren't going to just admit that William Gates III might as well be at the head of our modern world monarchy in all but name. I'm the king of the world! And... You know, even the royal lineage kind of fits too, considering that if America had dynasty families, they would probably be those prominent elite aristocratic families that concentrated in our major cities at the time of the founding of the nation. And one of those in Massachusetts Bay Colony is known as the Boston Brahmins. And one of the Boston Brahmin families, the Phillips family, is one that William Gates III is descended from. So bringing all this back around full circle. Okay, the real American Revolution began in the minds of the people. And if the American Revolution could truly hold up 
to the title of most successful revolution in modern world history, I believe the reason would have to lay in the fact that it's because the people stopped seeing themselves as lowly helpless subjects of King George III and his corrupt parliament. They stopped granting him and the British system their allegiance. They boycotted his goods, they stopped paying him their taxes, but more than either of these, they delegitimized him and they legitimized themselves. Then they dissolved their bonds with him in the Declaration of Independence, and it actually says that. So you had people living in an unofficial caste system who'd been referred to up until that time as the middling and lower sorts, what would have been referred to as the inferior sorts or the vulgar sorts of society, the people who are not elite, the average person, decided they were sick of being victims of the very system that they would require their consent and legitimization to continue. So they cast off their social status and they also rejected the status of the king. They raised themselves up off their knees, recognized their true power, which was in the granting or withholding of legitimacy to that king, and then they brought him down from his throne in their minds and hearts. They took their energy back from the king, first spiritually and mentally, and then finally physically in the forms of boycott and unpaid taxes. And then they told him in a united voice in no uncertain terms that they were free and independent people who would no longer be subjected to his rule, period. So his status as their king was revoked and the bond between the colonists and that king was dissolved. His crown at that point became little more than a worthless symbol without the people's authority invested in it. So they effectively reset the balance of power. I'll just close by asking a question. Have you ever heard of a time in history when people who were victims walking around with a victimhood mindset, just feeling hopeless like there's nothing they can do about their situation? Have you ever heard of a time where those people were ever able to alter that condition of victimhood with that mindset? Probably not. The colonists weren't coming from a place of victimhood. The slaves in Haiti prior to 1804 weren't coming from a place of victimhood because real change is not ever going to happen from there. And I know it didn't come across well in the last video I put up where I was very frustrated, but I feel like here in America, we've strayed really far from this. That we have people now who have somehow been programmed to actually believe that flaunting their victimhood is a modern 21st century badge of honor, right? That, no, I'm a bigger victim than you. No, I'm a bigger victim. And, and just stopping right there at that level of victimhood is never going to afford anyone the ability to rise up out of that condition. And we've also gotten to a point where people actually believe that the Bill of Rights grants them rights when that was never, that was never its intention because that's not possible. I've said this many times before, but it's worth repeating that the rights on that piece of paper are inherent. Inherent by definition means permanently existing in something, inseparably attached or connected, naturally pertaining to, innate, inalienable, the inherent right to life and liberty. The rights are inherent, God-given rights. Those things were written down simply to declare in ink the inherent God-given rights that already and always existed. A piece of paper doesn't grant those rights any more than a government or a billionaire or a king does. A person with God-given inherent rights is not a victim.